So my question for you is, if Mark is gifted some supernatural powers from some aliens, what powers would Mark wish for and how would he use for the betterment of the world? One of the great things about technology is you actually can build superpowers for people in the world. Uh, and you know, that's some of the stuff that I think is, is, is really exciting. So when I think about what we're doing with Oculus, for example, I think that what we're really enabling is people to teleport, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it's, you're going to be able to put on a headset and go anywhere you want in the world. You'll be able to go to places that are impossible to go to in the world. I mean, one of my, one of my favorite recent demos from Oculus is, um, you know, you put on the headset and you're in this room with someone uh, else who, who has the headset on somewhere else that can be in a completely different place. And, um, and there's this table in front of you. Of course, it's virtual. And you, there's a ping pong paddle on it. And you can pick up the ping pong paddle and you can start playing ping pong with the other person. And it, it just feels pretty awesome. It's like, all right, well, I might be in a completely different location from them, but we can kind of teleport and come together and, um, and have that experience. But that's only the beginning, because then where it really starts to get awesome is uh, you can then, in that experience, you can dial up and down gravity. So you can simulate, you can turn off gravity, and you can simulate what it would be like to play ping pong with a friend in space uh, or underwater. Uh, or you can make it, you know, anti-gravity. So that way, you know, the ball floats away and you have to hit it down in order to make it so that it doesn't go away. So, I mean, that's pretty crazy, right? And in the future, I think, you know, not too far out, we're going to have the ability to just put on a, a basic headset and instantaneously go anywhere in the world that you want. Uh, and that is going to be pretty good. <laughs> I'm Miriam George, Assistant Professor from CMR Institute of Technology, Bangalore. And uh, I'd say that internet.org is actually a great initiative which provides a lot of opportunities. However, there's been a lot of discussion and talks on net neutrality and internet.org. So my question is, does internet.org support net neutrality fully, let's say 100%, without any filtering? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, net neutrality is an important principle, right? And we do a lot to, to support it, both in terms of uh, pushing for regulation uh, that, that kind of enables this, and, um, I, I mean, also just in, in our own work, uh, building an open platform that any developer can, can build something for, uh, regardless of who they are, um, as long as they, they kind of follow the basic rules of what internet.org is. So, um, so let me, let me kind of explain and go into detail on, on both of these. So in terms of regulation, you know, now I, I think a lot of why there's this net neutrality debate um, here in India and in a lot of places around the world is countries are just kind of going around and figuring out what they want their regulation to be um, for the Internet and, and for net neutrality. Uh, the U.S., I think it was either earlier this year or last year, um, put in place rules that had uh, pretty strong net neutrality regulations that we... Um, gave our support for and, and suggested that there were kind of very clear rules on, on net neutrality. Um, that got put into place. And now kind of following that, a lot of other countries are also figuring out exactly what rules they want. Uh, and, and we're generally supportive of, of that across the world as well. Um, in terms of open platform, you know, there have been a lot of stories here in India that suggest that what we're trying to do with internet.org is, you know, just have a set of a small set of internet services that people can use and kind of somehow make it so that people can't have access to the rest. And that really couldn't be further from the truth. What we're trying to do is, you know, we realize that, you know, the internet is expensive to, to provide, right? I mean, the, the operators uh, all collectively spend, you know, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars on this infrastructure, and you can't just provide the whole internet for free. But what we have figured out is we can do this free basics program that make it so that you know, any developer who meets the, the definition of a basic service, so not very high bandwidth, no rich videos or big file downloads, but you know, any developer is doing something that's you know, basically uh, text, pretty low bandwidth, um, not directly um, cannibalizing uh, a lot of the operator business. Anyone can kind of offer their services for free, and it will be zero rated through uh, the free basics platform that we have. And that, I think, has been very powerful. And it provides this neutral platform where we're not being 
uh, a filter on any of the content that goes into that. And I think that that's really important and, um, and, and really good. So, you know, net neutrality overall, it's, uh, you know, this, this is an important topic, right? I mean, it's, it's really important that we have regulations that prevent uh, companies and people from doing things that are going to hurt people, right? And I think it's really clear if you look at uh, what the regulations are trying to prohibit, um, you know, where that hurts people and where it doesn't, right? So, you know, so if you're a, if you're a person, you're trying to, uh, you know, watch some videos on YouTube or, or Netflix, and an operator wants to charge you more to do that uh, than something else, then, you know, that's bad. I mean, that, that hurts people. Uh, it prevents your ability to access content. It, it's a violation of net neutrality, and that's the type of thing that we should have regulations that, uh, that, that prohibit. Um, if, if an operator is trying to advantage their, their own service, right, by making you pay more for something else, uh, then, you know, that's the kind of thing you can see why that, that hurts people, uh, and you want net neutrality regulations uh, in place that are going to prevent that. But at the same time, um, it is possible to take this too far, right? And some of the people who are advocating for net neutrality regulations also advocate that, you know, you shouldn't be able to do any kind of zero rating or free services at all. But when I look at this, I see, you know, if you have a student who is getting free access to the internet to be able to help do her homework and she wouldn't have had access otherwise, who's getting hurt there? Right? I mean, that, that's good. Right? We want that. There should be more of that. Um, you know, if you have, if there's a fisherman in, in a village uh, who now has some free access to the internet to help sell uh, some of his fish and provide for his family, no one gets hurt by that, right? And that's good. We, we need to get everyone on the internet. Um, so, and you know, the, the good news here is that around the world, uh, all the regulations that are put in place um, are basically honoring this principle, right? So good net neutrality provisions, kind of blocking things that, uh, that, that operators might do that, that kind of hurt people, but also prioritizing things like zero rating that are, are necessary for making sure that we can connect everyone to the internet. So the US regulations that I mentioned earlier, very clear on this, very strong net neutrality provisions, um, completely separate uh, in terms of how they treat zero rating and not blocking zero rating at all, right? So, and, and that's a country where most people have access to the internet. It's not, even, it's not like India where a billion people don't have access to the internet and even more innovation is necessary to, to expand on that. Uh, I think it's just this week, uh, the EU just released rules on net neutrality and zero rating where again, they put in place some net neutrality rules, very clear that zero rating and, and things that provide uh, some free access to, to the internet are, are kind of clear to go um, and are going to be regulated separately and are not prohibited by any of the net neutrality regulations. So that's my view on this. Um, Internet.org and Facebook 100% support net neutrality. We lobby for it across the world. We build an open platform with no filtering. Um, you guys should count on us to be supportive of that. But at the same time, um, I think we should all make sure that we also continue to push for access because that is extremely important. And um, you know, I'll leave you with one thought on this which is that most of the folks who are pushing for, for uh, net neutrality have access to the internet already, right? So, I mean, I see these, these um, petitions going around, around, around net neutrality, and, and that's great, right? I mean, we need to mobilize on the internet to push for this stuff. But the people who are not yet on the internet uh, can't sign an online petition pushing for uh, increased access to the internet, right? So, <laughs> so, it, yeah, and I think that this is, a, this is a really key point. We all, I think we all have a moral responsibility um, to look out for people who do not have the internet and make sure that uh, the rules that, that kind of benefit um, us and make sure that, that operators can't do anything that, that hurt us don't get twisted to hurt people who don't have a voice. So. Uh, Mark, you were at Taj yesterday. Somebody posted on your wall. Did people recognize you? Do you want to share some of your Taj experience with everybody? And whether you're recognized or not? <laughs> uh, the Taj was great. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's one of the few places in the world that you see pictures, but then you go, and it's actually even more awesome uh, there than any of the pictures look. Um, there aren't a lot of places like that. And you know, it's fitting because you travel around the world, and there are all these monuments that are built for uh, 
governments, you know, celebrating military victories or um, religion. And you know, the Taj is unique because it's a monument to love. And, <laughs> and I, I think that that's special. And I mean, that's, that's a, a meaningful thing. Um, so I, I really enjoyed it. I'm glad that I got a chance to go. Hi, I am Anand. And like, my question is, what was your Eureka moment when you actually founded Facebook? And like, you are really very young, but there would be many challenges as well. But what's the main driving force which keep you like, not uh, away from the track? Like, and this is my question. Uh, a couple of you have mentioned that, you know, that, that it's, it's great to have me here. I, I feel so honored to be here. And, to, um, and, and I know that, um, that there's... Uh, even more folks who um, who'd wanted to come here who uh, who who didn't have the chance, and uh, so next year we'll just need to, to do it in a stadium or something. I, I, I don't know. Um, the um, in, in terms of getting started with Facebook, you know, here here's the thing. It you know it wasn't so so long ago that you know I was a student and you know sitting in in a seat in an auditorium like uh, you guys are here today. Um, listening to, I remember very specifically this time when Bill Gates came to talk at, at Harvard, and um, I was just like, wow, how, how, do, you, how do you do that? Um, <laughs> and, um, but, you know, the trick is, is that the media likes to sensationalize this as if you have some eureka moment or you are some singular person who can build something on your own, and that's just not how the world works. Um, you know, when I was in school, I built a lot of stuff that I just liked building. Um, there was not a single moment when I, when I had some revelation that Facebook was going to be awesome. Uh, that's not maybe how the media or movies or whatever would like to uh, portray things. It's, not, it's much less exciting. But the reality is I think most... Uh, services in the world that reach the scale that Facebook has, um, you start off building something that you care about, and you, know, you don't necessarily think it's going to be that big. I, I didn't. Um, you know, I built Facebook, the first version of Facebook, uh, for my college community because I wanted to be able to connect with the people at my school. And I remember very clearly talking to my friends at the time and saying, you know, it's, how cool is it that we have built this community for our school? You know, one day it's going to be awesome when somebody else builds this for the world because something like this needs to exist for the world. But it didn't even occur to me that, you know, my friends and I might be able to play a role in doing that, right? Because we, we were college students, right? I mean, we didn't have any, you know, engineers to, to work with or servers or resources or anything like that. And, you know, there are these huge companies that deliver products for hundreds of millions of people, right? There's... You know, I always assumed that it was going to be like Microsoft or Google or uh, someone would build this for the world. And what basically just happened is um, at each step along the way, we just kind of kept doing the next thing and uh, growing from there. And you know, there, there were teams inside these other companies that, that thought social media was important and were working on it. But you know, there were all these different memes and, and narratives uh, in the world. You know, people would say, oh, well, you know, this is just a fad. People are going to use it, but then they're going to stop. So, um, you know, so a lot of the teams we were working on didn't take it that seriously, or, you know, the, the higher-ups in those companies didn't care, so they didn't get resources, and we just kept going and going. And then people would say, all right, well, all right, fine. So maybe people are using it, but it's never going to make any money, right? I mean, social media doesn't make any money. And we, we just kind of kept going and uh, going, and then pretty soon we had a service that was uh, bigger than any of these other ones, and that kind of is how we are here where we are. Um, there's no magic. Um, and, it's, uh, and, and I really think it's like, I mean, you guys are, are at you know, one of the best uh, technical institutes in the world. You know, one of the things that, that always struck me, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, when I was in school and studying computer science, I always wondered whether it was the real thing, right? Is this like, like all right, I'm, I'm, I'm learning programming, but is this the programming that you really need to be able to build whatever you want in the world? And it turns out the answer to that is absolutely yes. Right? The, the stuff that you're, uh, that you're learning here is absolutely, uh, are absolutely the skills that you need to build anything that you want. And um, you know, a lot of times I think people just get afraid because you know, often your dream is, it's, it seems like it's so, um, 
so far off, but, but if you just kind of focus on building stuff that you think is good and, uh, and, and you keep on going at each step along the way and don't let people deter you from that and you just really care about what you're doing and kind of don't give up at each step along the way, then um, you know, I think that's how you, uh, that's how you build something good. Okay, we have another student question here. Ayush. Uh, hi, Mark. Uh, I'm Ayush. I'm a uh, uh, second year undergrad uh, in computer science here at IIT Delhi itself. Uh, so my question is, um, like considering the startup buzz everywhere, so uh, everyone uh, comes up with a random app or website uh, idea and considers himself as, a, as the next big thing. So uh, what, what according to you is... Um, uh, are the elements of, a, of an ideal startup? So there's this big culture that I've seen of people who decide that they want to start a company before they actually know what they're doing. And to me, to me, every good company that I can think of started with someone who cared about something, not someone who started with a decision that they wanted to start a company. And I think that that's both because of who the people are who do that, right? And, you know, and, and, you know building a company is hard and you, know, you need to kind of keep going through all the, the people who are gonna doubt you and all the challenges that are gonna come up. So you really do need to care, I think, in order to do that. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's also a practical reason for this, which is that if you decide to start a company and you just start hiring people for whatever your first idea is, then you lose some flexibility. Right, it becomes hard to, to pivot or, or uh, adapt your idea. Whereas, you know, if you start working on something because you care about it, and you only decide to turn it into a company uh, once it's pretty clear that it can be good, then you actually maintain a lot of flexibility to try out different things that uh, fit your theme of what you care about. And then um, by the time that you actually hit something that's kind of working, you then start hiring and then those companies have a lot more flexibility and, and therefore I think are more likely to work well. But, you know, I mean, most of the great companies that I can think of, they're, they're started by people who really care about what they're doing. They may not have thought that they were going to end up building uh, big companies. Almost none of the people I know who have built big companies thought that their companies were going to be as big as they actually ended up being, which I think is just a testament to if you kind of care about something and keep going, it can end up just being a lot bigger than you think it's going to in the beginning. But, um, but I would definitely, if you're thinking about starting something, focus on what you want to do in the world and the impact and what you want to change, uh, not the decision to start a company. We have our next student question here. Namaste, Mark. So I'm Roshi Dana from IIT Delhi itself. And uh, my question is that uh, there comes a time in every, every student's life uh, when he or she is completely demotivated. And at that time, soothing words from well-wishers and friends, they seem completely empty. So you must have faced such kind of situation in your life maybe more than once. So if you would like to share an anecdote um, and suggest what should be done during those times. Yes. It w when it w so uh, throughout building Facebook, I mean, there have been lots of challenges and there are all these times where in anything you do where you know, you're really going to be pushed and you um, feel like you want to give up or something like that. And you know, this gets back to, I was talking a second ago about how I think the media, there's a little bit of this b cultural bias towards thinking that you know, one person does this. Right? I mean, people say that you know, I built Facebook or Steve Jobs built Apple or whatever, but you know, that's really not true. Right? I mean, it's, we're, we're people, we, we helped, uh, but there were thousands and thousands of other people involved in building these things. And the reality is, is that as strong as any one individual is, no one person can deal with all the challenges that are gonna get thrown at them in, in anything that you do. And one of the ways that I think we maintain resilience is by having um, co-founders and partners who complement our strengths and uh, fortify our weaknesses and can kind of encourage us and give us a push to to keep going when things are tough. And there's actually a lot of data on this that suggests that companies that get started with more co-founders are more likely to be successful. And it isn't quite clear um, exactly from that data why that's the case, although it is very clear in terms of the outcome for the startups that it is the case. Um, but I would guess that the reason why that's the case is because of this resilience point, where people who start something by themselves, I, I just think like, 
there's no way that any one person can overcome all of the different things that you need to do to, to build a startup or take on any kind of other project in the world. But if you have two or three or four partners, then I don't know. I mean, maybe over time, one of them doesn't like it and, and drops out, but you still have enough strength on the team to power through all the challenges that you have, and that's kind of how you go. And you know, at Facebook today, one of the things that I always find a little bit funny is, again, that so much attention is placed on, on me as the person running the company, whereas I think you know, people like Cheryl, um, who really you know, is my partner running the whole business, or you know, folks like Chris Cox, who run a huge amount of our product, or um, Mike Schrepfer, who's our chief technology officer and, and kind of makes sure that a ton of uh, what we're doing works, or Jay Parikh, who you know, runs all of our global infrastructure and, and all the data centers around the world. We, we couldn't make Facebook work without those people. Right? And, and there were really hard days where, where I'm not sure what to do next, and, and, and they keep me going. We have one more student question here. Hi, Mark. I'm Saranj Goel. I'm a computer science student at IIT. Uh, my question is, what was the decision that you took during the early days of Facebook, which you uh, regretted later? <laughs> one decision? <laughs> um, let me frame this a little differently. So no matter what you do, you're going to make a ton of mistakes, right? And I made it every mistake I think you can probably make. I mean, mistakes in how to set up the company, mistakes in hiring, product mistakes, technical mistakes, um, anything you can, you can kind of think about doing wrong, um, I have probably made that mistake um, in, in trying to kind of build Facebook up, right? I mean, and it, it kind of makes sense. I was a college student when I got started, right? I mean, I didn't know anything about business or hiring. You know, no one is born with these skills, right? So you, you learn them the same way that you learn uh, everything else, right? Trial and error. You, you do it. Uh, you don't be too afraid to make mistakes, and you do make mistakes, and you recover, and you keep going. The, the thing that I think is really what you should focus on is not what is the mistake that you should avoid, but instead, if you do something good, you get the strength to power through a lot of mistakes, right? And we're, the reason why Facebook exists today and is serving a community of you know, more than one and a half billion people is not because we didn't make mistakes. It's because we're helping people with something that's very important in their lives, right? Every person wants to stay connected with their friends and family. And if you're doing something that's very important and valuable to people, then they'll forgive you if you make some mistakes along the way. And, you know, that's important because we're all human, right? And, you know, no one's perfect. And we've made a lot of mistakes and we will continue because, you know, I'm, I still have a lot to learn, right, on this journey. Um, there's a lot of new stuff that we're, that we're trying to do and, um, and trying to help uh, improve in the world. So I think that that's what you want to focus on, is, um, is not, not what are the mistakes that you don't want to make, but just do as much good as you can. OK, we're completely out of time. We'll take one last audience question. All Somebody right. here who has been gesturing and waving for a long time. So I'm just going to give her the mic. Hi, Mark. Welcome to India. I'm Thank Gargi, you. PhD student. And my question is, can we do something about the missing people? Like we are getting the earthquake notifications that person is safe or not. So can we have some notification for missing people? Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a really good point. We actually, there's a program in the U.S. and Canada, and I think in, that's it for now, uh, but we're rolling out further. Um, that's called Amber Alerts. And what it basically is, uh, is a program where if children are missing uh, in their area, we will put a story in newsfeed showing that child's face and giving you a way to report to the local police and uh, and, and other agencies if you've seen that person. And um, it's an incredibly successful program, right? And it's um, in the, I think we, we've launched it less than a year ago. I think it was January of this year we started rolling this out in the U.S. And already uh, at least one child has been found through the program on Facebook. Uh, I mean, basically, you know, someone saw the, the photo in newsfeed, saw the, the Amber Alert, and then um, realized that one of the kids who was 
uh, around them was this kid who was missing and reported to the police and the child was recovered and, and brought home safely. And, um, you know, we need to work with, with governments and uh, folks in countries all over the world to, to bring this out to more places, but absolutely, I think, is the answer to your question. You know, I think, you know, when you have a community of a billion and a half people, I think you have a responsibility to help people coordinate to do awesome things in the world. And, you know, whether that's coordinating to, uh, for relief efforts, like, uh, for example, our community helped raise, I think it was $17 million for the earthquake relief effort in Nepal, or the community uh, safety check effort that, that we have to make sure that everyone knows each other is safe, or the organ donation work that we do to make it so that people can um, mark that they want to be an organ donor, um, so that way more people can have access to, to, um, to the organ transplants that they need. Um, this is all stuff that I think we want to do and that's really important uh, and that I think our community wants to be a part of and that we're uh, looking forward to doing over the coming years. So, thank you. Thank you guys so much.